I watched the moon landing in 1969 uh, when I was five years old, and it had a huge impact on me. I remember I could tell how excited all the grown-ups around me were. And I think, by the way, that's one of the gigantic legacies of Apollo, is it inspired so many people to enter science, engineering, uh, uh, become pioneers, explorers. The real problem with doing interesting things in space is that the price of admission is so high that you can't have that kind of entrepreneurial dynamism that I witnessed up close and that all of us witnessed happen on the internet over the last two decades. We don't have the infrastructure to do that in space today. If you're in your dorm room, you're not gonna start an interesting space company. It's, you know, the, the starting price tags to do really interesting things in space are hundreds of millions of dollars going quickly to billions. But if we had reusable space vehicles, then we'd be able to, that would start to change everything. What has the technology that was developed throughout the 60s and 70s made possible that wasn't possible then? So much, so so much has changed. If you were to go back in time to the 60s and bring you know, the great engineers from that era to today, there are a lot of things that they would be astonished by. Um, first and foremost amongst those is computation. I mean, the, what we can do with computers and software, they could have only dreamed about. So many brilliant people worked on the space program in the 60s that they came up with an amazing set of genius ideas that we're still using and harvesting today. And what are we going to do on the moon when we Well, when we so the, we know things about the moon now that we didn't know uh, back in the Apollo days. Even just 20 years ago, we didn't know. We know for sure now that there is water on the moon in the form of ice in the permanently shadowed craters on the poles. And we can harvest that ice and use it to make hydrogen and oxygen, which are rocket propellants, high performance rocket propellants. That's why our blue moon is powered by a, the BE, a BE7 uh, engine, which, has, uh, which is uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And the reason we chose those propellants, A, they're the highest performing propellants, but B, we know one day we'll be refueling that vehicle on the surface of the moon from propellants made on the moon from that water ice. What's the hardest thing um, sort of on the human Organizationally, side? Organizationally, yeah. as a human, it's be fun to see the results of your work sooner. The kinds of things we're working on have you know, 15, 20 year kinds of time frames, and that's very, very challenging. The tools that we use at Blue Origin, we're all, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. When I talk about those you know, simulation tools that we use, the computer design tools, the, um, the, the computational fluid dynamics tools that let us do aero simulations of aerodynamics, those were all created and validated by NASA painstakingly over the last five decades. It's going to be difficult to put humans on the moon without government support. It's, too, it's expensive. We need government facilities to do it. We need government know how to do it. It has to be a team effort. It'll be many companies, not just Blue Origin. It'll be collaborative. Why did you choose the name Blue Origin? Yeah. And what is, uh, why are we doing this? Yes, this is, thank you for asking that. I think this is a really important question. It's called Blue Origin because this is the blue planet, and this is the planet that we have to save. This is the good planet in our solar system. We've sent robotic probes to all the planets now. This is the only good one. 